Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Florida Supernature. Today, we're going to be looking at spiders. Welcome to the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. Today's presentation is spiders. My name is James Stevenson, and I work here at Brooker Creek Preserve in the north part of Pinellas County. We're 9,000 acres of undeveloped Pinellas County, where you can come as a visitor and see all sorts of native plants and animals that are unique to our county. So do come and visit us. The trails are open and the water is fine, as it were. So today's presentation is spiders. We're going to look at what spiders are, how they work, and then we'll look at some common local spiders. So you know what you're getting into. We're talking about spiders, all right? Why do spiders freak people out? Why are spiders um, considered spooky or scary or dangerous? We associate spiders with these fangs. We associate spiders with uh, creepy uh, haunted houses. Spiders have this wonderful um, ability to produce this uh, substance called silk. Spider silk does not degrade and it um, can last forever in haunted or unhaunted houses. But what are spiders? Okay, we kind of get the idea kind of um, as, an, as an imaginary thing or as we, what we imagine spiders to be, but really what are they? Spiders kind of arrived on the scene millions of years ago as, as with most animals, if not all animals, uh, in the oceans. And there was this group of organisms with segmented bodies um, and these very interesting kind of what we as kids might call feelers uh, on the front of their uh, head region. Um, and these were the anomalocaridids. Uh, this was long, long, long time ago. And as animals began to move on to the land, these segmented creatures became known as what we refer to as the arthropods. These creatures, if you'll look, they have a hardened exoskeleton. So they are already kind of pre-adapted to life out of water. They already have an exoskeleton that doesn't collapse if they were to come out of the buoyancy of the sea. And these jointed organisms, uh, arthro means joints. And if you have arthritis, swollen joints, you'll know very well the, the root of that word. So these are the uh, jointed uh, animals. We have within the arthropods, uh, we have the insects with their three main body parts. We have the crustaceans, perhaps the most uh, famous, if you will, of the arthropods uh, with their two main body segments. There's a small group called the myriapods, you know, the centipedes and millipedes. And then we have our group, a very early divulging. So here we have the anomalocaridids down here. And then as they developed, they branched into these other groups that continued to branch until the most advanced of the arthropods and the most diverse would be uh, the insects. But down here on the other end, the quote unquote most primitive, the most closest to that uh, seagoing organism, the anomalocaridid, uh, uh, we have the chelicerates. Stay with me, it gets better, I promise. Within this group of the chelicerates, we have all these different spider relatives. Now remember, these are different from the insects. These are on two far ends of the arthropod uh, evolutionary tree. So down here at the bottom, we have these quote unquote primitive group and all these spider relatives, including the scorpions and the whip scorpions or vinegar runes, what people call daddy long legs, which are not very uh, common in the central and southern part of Florida. Uh, the amblypigids, which are absolutely uh, nightmare material, but they make excellent pets, believe it or not. The ticks are a relative of the spiders. All these organisms, of course, having how many legs? The spiders, how many legs? Well done. And we have this group that are the proper spiders. So we went from 
all these different organisms, all the different insects, all the different crustaceans, all the different centipedes and myriapods, drilled down into this group with the eight legs, the chelicerates, and we're going to take one group out of that and we'll discuss the spiders. How do they work? Talking about segments, they have these segments that their bodies are broken into and the different segments have different quote unquote jobs to do. So here is a section through a spider. I asked if you were all okay and you knew it was going to get a little, so here we are, with a cut open spider. And we have all these um, different body parts that are not unique to spiders with a few exceptions. Uh, the chelicera, which gives it its name, uh, is unique to the spiders. Uh, book lungs are kind of an uh, interesting adaptation that spiders. Uh, and the silk gland and spinnerets. Otherwise, it's just basics on how to exist as a living multicellular organism. They need eyes, they need a brain, they need stomach and heart and intestines and ovaries for reproduction and so on. So they have the basic parts of any multicellular organism, but they have a few extras. Now, the eyes of a spider are quite interesting. Did you know how many eyes spiders have? They have more than two. Um, the chelicera, here we have the chelicera, these two large appendages on the head region that host the fangs which I'm sure spiders are very well known for, although of course they're not the only multicellular organisms to have fangs. We all know that spiders do have fangs, uh, but those eyes, um, those eight eyes, in fact, uh, in, the, in the hunting spiders work a lot like ours. So technically we're predators, our eyes face forward. We're looking for our prey. We're actively walking towards our food. But spiders have auxiliary eyes that can help detect surroundings and they can help detect uh, if something is coming at them from above, if, if the light levels change, that sort of thing. And the way that their eyes are organized or arranged on their head can help with the identification of different groups of spiders. So what we have here are um, selfies or face shots of various groups of spiders showing the unique arrangement of their eyeballs on top of their head. And like I mentioned, the hunting spiders uh, have the big forward facing eyes and their auxiliary eyes kind of uh, off to the side and much smaller. Uh, let's take the example of the Uranids. Uh, these aren't active hunters. These use a sense of touch. Uh, they can sense through the hairs on their body the direction that their prey is coming from so they don't rely very much on their eyesight to detect prey. They use their eyes and their um, all these auxiliary little smaller eyes uh, to pick up uh, various shades, uh, but not actually the, the view or the vision of, the, of their prey species. So these are just different eye arrangements of the different, some of the different groups of spiders. The silk gland, as mentioned before, is uh, a unique, feature of these spiders and of course it allows them to spin that wonderful material called spider silk. And spiders produce silk from the back end. You'll notice where the, uh, the, the, the silk glands is actually separate from their excretory uh, department as it were. They have uh, their own location in the abdomen area and the spinnerets are what actually form uh, the liquid silk into whichever type of silk the spider is trying to create. So here we have the back end of a spider ejecting some of that liquid silk into solid form uh, with the help of these special organs working together, the spinnerets. Now spiders can create seven or eight different kinds of silk. Uh, it's not just one material that comes shooting out and turns into whatever they need. Uh, this is a scanning electron microscope photograph, uh, so very, very many times enlarged of those individual little cells uh, ejecting the liquid silk and then the spinnerets turning it into these different types of silk uh, they use for drag lines. Uh, spiders can fly. 
uh, and they use silk to fly, uh, to line an egg case, uh, to line their burrow, uh, trapping prey and immobilizing victims, because all these different types of silks will have different characteristics. You don't necessarily want um, a trap type silk lining your egg case or your babies won't be able to get out. So spiders can produce several different types of silk. They use, like I said, a drag line. So here's a jumping spider making a leap of faith. It has anch anchored the, the drag line to a, a sturdy surface and has leapt. And should this little spider miss its target, it won't fall as far as it can down. It'll only fall as far as it has ejected um, silk and will be able to wind itself back up and try again. This is how spiders fly. Uh, young spiders and even somewhat mature spiders uh, can use the electrostatic charge as well as the buoyancy of their silk uh, to catch the faintest breeze. And so spiders have the ability to climb to a, as, as high up as they can get, lift their abdomen, release a strand of specialized silk, and then let go and let the wind carry them as far and wide as needs be. As I mentioned before, you're gonna to wanna to wrap, if you're a mother spider, in this case, a black widow, uh, very, very good mother skills, very good parenting skills, a very watchful guard of her young that are encased within this very, very soft silk uh, that's sturdy, that's waterproof, uh, that, contain, that can maintain uh, an acceptable humidity level around the eggs, but is not too thick so that the young upon hatching can't escape. So a special kind of web there. Uh, some spiders, uh, they, like to, they like to protect their bodies. And if they live in, in this case, a hole that's been uh, excavated into the sandy earth, they're gonna line that burrow with a layer of silk uh, to protect their soft bodies. And if, if you'll look closely on all the slides of the various spiders that we're gonna be looking at today, you'll see that their, their bodies are absolutely covered in these sensitive hairs. It's these hairs that detect the world, much like the antenna of, of insects. They use these hairs to detect things like movement, humidity, uh, various vibrations, uh, they can pick up chemical signals. And so they're very, very delicate. And this, uh, this nice silk lining in this sandy burrow is going to protect these animals. And of course, trapping prey. We all know the, um, the, the classic spiders live in these orb webs. Uh, not all spiders live in webs, and we'll learn about that in a bit. But if you were to ask a kid to draw a spider, they would probably include this web structure as well. And a special, several different kinds of silk are used in the construction of a web. There are the strong lateral lines that are gonna anchor this web in place. And then the very, very sticky kind of uh, weaving uh, the lines that uh, can actually ensnare the prey. So that's going to be the sticky, um, the web. Yes, spiders can get stuck to their own sticky webbing but they know and they have enough legs and pointy little legs to be able to maneuver their own web and not become entangled. They can tiptoe through their own tulips as it were. And of course, wrapping prey, uh, there's a special silk that can uh, kind of act like uh, a cling wrap in your kitchen. Uh, if you wanna wrap up some food to eat later, uh, not let it spoil too quickly, uh, go ahead and wrap it up and put it away. That's exactly what's happening here. This is the spotted orb weaver, one of the orb weavers, uh, who's wrapping its prey. It's not going to eat it right away, uh, but it's going to put it in a special place in the web, um, safe from anyone, hopefully, from trying to come and steal that prey, and they can have it uh, at a later time when they're not actively hunting, perhaps overnight or something like that. So that's the web, that's the spinnerets and the silk gland kind of unique to the spiders. Uh, the poison gland, the pedipalp and the chelicera, uh, this holy trinity, if you will, uh, is how spiders immobilize and digest their prey through the use of uh, the fangs at the end of the chelicera uh, that have poison, uh, venom, 
the, and digestive juices, sometimes they're the same chemical compound that are both the venom and the digestive agent uh, that's injected into the prey and then slurped up um, into the stomach uh, through a sucking mouth part. So um, these are spiders enjoy a liquid diet. Now there's basically to, we can take all those different kinds of spiders with all those different eyeball arrangements and we can split them into two groups. Those orb weavers, those that sit very still, those that are referred to as the lie in wait. Uh, they sit still in their sticky traps or they sit still with their foot on a trip wire, if you will, a trip wire that's made of some special silk so that they can detect the presence of prey species and then run out and get it after it's already been trapped. Uh, counter that to the other uh, lifestyle, uh, which are the hunters. These don't build webs. Uh, they do have the ability to spin silk and they still have need for all the different uh, types of silk, but the hunters, they don't build a web and wait in it. They actively run around looking for their prey. And if you've ever been startled by one of these, uh, this is the huntsman spider, um, not really appropriately named because the larger spiders that you see, the active hunters and the large spiders sitting in the webs, they're all female. Uh, you're probably not going to see very many male spiders in your life unless you're looking for them. It's the females that get to be the large size. It's the females that do the majority of the hunting. Uh, so this should be a huntswoman. Um, spider because that would be a female. The active hunters of course would have the forward facing eyes so they can see their prey, they can run up to their prey and then use whatever means they have possible. And in the case of the male regal jumping spider here, uh, these large uh, chelicera and fangs that they can use to actually grab the prey um, versus the lie in wait uh, with their smaller uh, they don't have that, uh, they don't need to have that ambush type of weapon, those fangs that actually uh, attack the prey, because they're catching their prey in their sticky web. And then once the prey is immobilized, uh, the fangs can be exerted, uh, the, the neurotoxin or whatever kind of toxin, the venom can be injected, the digestive juices can be injected, um, but the, the prey is already caught. Now what this looks like, uh, a, a section, through the chelicera here. Uh, the chelicera is basically the conduit between where the venom is produced, where the digestive enzymes are produced, uh, through the chelicera and out through the duct and through the hollow fang. And here we have a jumping spider, one of our, of course, active hunting, uh, who has embedded its fangs at the tip of the chelicera here into its prey victim, in this case, a grasshopper. Um, of course, insects being a large part of spiders' diets, insects with their exoskeletons, they have to be punctured in order for that uh, immobilizing venom and the digestive juices to be injected into the prey victim to dissolve the inside within the exoskeleton and then slurp back out. And here we have one of the orb weavers uh, who has waited in the web until the web does all the work, uh, ensnares whatever that was, and then the spotted orb weaver has come in and is wrapping it up uh, for a later date. Another interesting adaptation that our spiders have is the way that they breathe. Like insects, uh, spiders do not breathe in and out of their mouth. Uh, they don't have these lungs that they inflate and deflate, uh, causing positive and negative pressure to, to bring air in and out of their, uh, in and out of their uh, body. Instead, they have what's called a book lung, and it's called a book lung because it has these quote unquote pages, this heightened surface area uh, where the, uh, that's open to the outside environment. And that can actually bring air oxygenated air into the viscera, into the guts, where it is directly exposed to all these interior tissues 
and oxygen is allowed to then pass through all the body parts uh, through the soup that holds all of these organs together. And that soup is what is most delicious uh, to all of the spiders in the case of insects and to um, insects in the case of insectivores. Now, what the book lung looks like, here's just a little bit of a close up. We have, here we have the pore that's open to the outside. And again, this is on the underside of the uh, spider's body so that you know, rain doesn't, if, if the lungs were on the back, you know, rain and other environmental uh, pollutants, if you will, dust and all that sort of thing could clog the pore and, and suffocate the poor thing. So the book lungs are safely tucked up underneath the body and air kind of passively flows over this increased surface area. And there is this actual hemolymph uh, which is the fancy word for spider blood is hemolymph, this, uh, this fluid that passes throughout the body. The pedipalps are a modified leg. Now we said that uh, spiders have eight legs that they use for their locomotion. Their legs are often covered in these sensitive hairs as well, but pedipalps are found around the mouth region. So they're kind of half mouth part half leg, and they use their pedipalps to manipulate their food. The pedipalps are sensory, and all the sensory organs, the hairs, uh, the pedipalps, uh, they're all connected to the brain, and the brain can, uh, the brain of a spider can determine, can make all kinds of decisions and choices based on what it's feeling and detecting, what it's seeing, all these things that make up the uh, kind of neuro system of the spider. So that's spiders on the inside. I hope, is everyone still here? We haven't had too many drop out yet, that's great. Hang in there. We're gonna start looking at some of our local spiders, some of our common local spiders that you might see in your own backyard. And we'll start with, of course, the orb weavers. Again, if you're talking about spiders to a kid, going to refer to this, this web, uh, but what we're learning today is not all spiders make webs, but when they do, the web has a, has a very, very fascinating structure, very, very complex and fascinating structure. So of course, the web spinners would be a type of lie in wait. They sit very, very still in their web and wait for something to come to them. Our largest orb weaver or web spinner uh, is the golden silk orb weaver. And if you have an average sized monitor on your desktop, if you're looking at this on a desktop, this is pretty close to actual size. Uh, orb weavers uh, from tip to tip, uh, from the tip of the foreleg to the tip of the hind leg can be about four inches long. So it's a big spider with a big abdomen. Uh, some people call these banana spiders because they have this elongated abdom abdomen uh, that is yellow in color. Uh, this slide with the white background allows you to see the hairs, those um, very sensitive hairs that allow this orb weaver, when it's sitting in its web, to detect which direction uh, the vibrations might be coming from. You'll note that there are concentrated hairs on certain segments of this orb weaver's legs and the two uh, penultimate hind legs, if you will, they're lacking those tufts of hair. And again, this would be the female. The large, the showy, the visible uh, are the female of the spiders. You rarely get a glimpse of the males. And here we have not an extra pair of legs, but those pedipalps that are also very, very sensitive and help maneuver uh, the, the prey uh, for eating. It's called a golden silk orb weaver because the silk that this spider produces is actually gold tinted. And legend has it that the golden fleece from Jason and the Argonauts was actually a garment that had been made from this spider's web. Male golden orb weavers, here he is. That's all you get. He's got one job and he's done for the year. Uh, very, very small. Uh, like I said, he's only got the one job to do uh, to marry his bride and start the next generation. Uh, what the male spider has to watch out for is um, angering, startling, 
or entering the web of a female spider that's particularly hungry because if the male doesn't detect his footing and trips uh, a wire, as it were, uh, a piece of silk that alerts the female to the presence of food, that's exactly how she's gonna treat him. If the male golden silk orb weaver can maneuver himself through the web without being detected and sneak up on the female, he has a better chance of um, handing over the wedding gift, as it were, that will then allow her to go and lay eggs and start the next generation of spiders. Uh, the male will often wait until the female is distracted uh, and eating some prey. Uh, so she's mainly focused on, you know, eating, feeding at the time. And that's when he might make his move. That's why that might be when he sneaks up and delivers that wedding present. Within the web of the golden orb weaver and several other species, we have this little interloper. This is called a dewdrop spider, uh, and it does look a lot like a drop of water in the golden silk orb weaver's web. Uh, and that's how it wants to appear to that female uh, as just nothing more than a drop of water within the web. Uh, the dewdrop spider is, call, is what's called a kleptoparasite a thieving parasite. I don't think anyone would like to be called a thieving parasite, but that is this spider's life history. It has the ability to wander through the golden silk orb weaver's web undetected, posing as a drop of water, uh, and it can go to that spider's larder, uh, where that spider has prey, prey species, prey victims, I should say, that are wrapped up for later consumption. Uh, they can actually detect those wrapped up, those uh, cling, cling film wrapped up snacks and cut the main lines of web free from the web and then descend upon that dangling line and consume uh, that spider's hard work. So they're kleptoparasites, these dewdrop spiders. This one gets a lot of press every year. They're just beginning to become full grown now. Uh, those egg cases that overwintered hatched this spring. Uh, the young spiders dispersed, uh, began to build their first little tiny, tiny, tiny little webs and, and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And right around now, they're reaching their full size. And right around now is when uh, our extension services that we're a part of, people like to send us pictures of uh, creepy things, things that are freaking them out. Is this going to kill my dog? Is this going to eat my tomato plants? That sort of thing. We are beginning to get photographs of the spiny backed orb weaver because it looks so terrifying. Um, there's a horror movie from back in the 80s about, I think it was Halloween and the, the villain wore a, a hockey mask. And so I think he was called Jason and people have said, this thing looks like Jason. It's got to be evil. It cannot exist in my yard. But it's just a spiny backed orb weaver. It's just a little orb weaving spider trying to make its living and not be swallowed by a bird. Uh, birds quite like spiders. They have this nice juicy abdomen full of all that hemolymph and all those wonderful organs. The spinnerets are particularly yummy apparently. Uh, but this spider has adaptations to preclude being eaten. Uh, it's uh, got these defensive spines uh, as a warning, don't bother, and as a deterrent should a young bird make the mistake of swallowing this. Several of the orb weaving spiders produce a special type of silk within certain areas of the web. Uh, in the case of the spiny backed orb weaver, you can see it's made this, these kind of patterns on some of the main uh, girders of the web infrastructure. Uh, these concentrations of webbing are referred to as stabilimentum. Stabilizing elements is what they were once thought to be. Uh, they're probably best pronounced in this orb weaver, uh, the garden spider, uh, the black and yellow garden spider. This one's also very familiar. Again, this being the female, uh, large and in charge. She's got to catch lots of prey. She's got to get great figs so she can lay lots and lots of eggs. But she too has created this area 
of stabilimentum. And as I was mentioning, it originally thought that this was some way of um, stabilizing or strengthening the web structure. Uh, it has since been kind of studied very, not necessarily too scientifically with all the proper um, checks and balances, but an amateur scientist did uh, several experiments that showed that birds would avoid flying into and thus destroying a hard night's work of creating this web that is brought down and reconstructed daily. That's a lot of work and a lot of, uh, a lot of silk. Uh, so this is probably not only to hide the spider from the bird, because as I mentioned, spiders are quite yummy, uh, but also to alert the flying bird to avoid smacking into the web, because that doesn't end well for any one. Another one of our interesting orb weavers is the arrow-shaped orb weaver, again with these uh, warning and perhaps defensive uh, outgrowths of this abdominal area. Uh, this is a photograph taken right here at Brooker Creek, so we're on the lookout looking for these adults right now uh, because they're, they're just so designer, they're so neat looking. Uh, and here you can see they have uh, some larger eyes that help them navigate through their web, uh, but mostly their eyes are small and scattered around the head region, uh, relying mostly on uh, the vibrations that they pick up in their orb web. The spotted orb weaver, we saw that one before. I believe it's called spotted. I remember spotted orb weaver because of the checkerboard pattern on their legs. That's how I remember spotted. Although it could have more to do with the uh, whitish areas on the abdomen here, although you'd have to get really close uh, to make that determination. So I stay back and I look at the, I, the, the spotted legs. Some people also refer to this as the red shin, like the shin on your leg, the red shin, because it has the, the leg bases are this reddish colors. But this is a very common uh, orb weaver around in the summertime in our area of Florida, the spotted orb weaver, uh, about the size of your thumbnail. Here we have the, the, the patterning on the backside, and you can see this is another one of the orb weavers that creates that area of stabilimenta. Another orb weaver is the very beautiful orchard orb weaver. Uh, this is not life size. This is a very, very small little orb weaver. And this one tends to create horizontal webs, whereas most of the other orb weavers that we've looked at before have vertical webs that will catch uh, kind of uh, insects flying back and forth. Uh, the orchard orb weaver is going to catch insects that are moving up and down. So insects that might move up out of the leaf, leaf litter at nighttime when it's safe to emerge from their hiding places. And also in the morning when those smaller insects might be descending back down into the leaf litter to spend the day hiding. So the orchard orb weaver is going to catch those. Now what's striking about the orchard orb weaver uh, these beautiful colors, they're sometimes called the um, enameled um, orb weaver uh, because they have all these lovely colors. And what you notice in this horizontal web is this red spot on the abdomen. What does that make you think of? And I think it's exactly what the orchard orb weaver wants you to think of, the black widow. So yes, here we have a spider that has actually got uh, the right size fangs uh, and the right strength or toxicity of venom that can actually cause harm to a human who would accidentally disturb this spider's web. Um, the female southern black widow spider, of course, this is her, the widow, uh, is a very fierce defender of her eggs. Uh, many other spiders will flee if a, uh, if a threat is posed to their egg case. The black widow will defend her egg cases and she will use her fangs against an organism 
that could be hundreds of times larger than herself. The majority of spiders will drop out of sight, just give everything up, just not defend, but the black widow is defensive. Now, there are no spiders that are going to attack humans. There are only spiders that will defend their offspring. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have to try and get bitten by a spider. You have to reach into the web, press on a spider. You know, you have to try and get bitten by a spider. There is no spider that is going to launch out of a hedgerow to attack you because you're way too big. So yes, there are dangerous spiders, uh, but again, they're not a threat. You have to kind of go to them to have them bite you. A lot of discussion about the brown recluse spider. Uh, I just wanted to show you the range of the various different species of the recluse spiders in the United States. Uh, there are very Midwestern and Southwest US, uh, very not even widespread throughout the Southwest US. So we do not have an established population of brown recluse in Florida. Um, there might be a couple here and there. They might have arrived in, in things like suitcases, but uh, they're certainly not well established and expanding their range. Uh, they, have, they don't have a foothold yet in Florida. So um, of all the brown spiders that are out there, and there are a lot, it's kind of the default color. Not all brown spiders are recluses and hardly any, if any, brown spiders that you will see in Pinellas County are going to be a recluse spider. So those are, the, those are the orb weavers, those are the lion weight. We finished up with uh, kind of debunking the whole uh, brown recluse being loose. Uh, brown recluse does though uh, fall into the category of the active hunters. They don't, uh, they don't produce the orbs, the orb webs. So that's gonna segue us into these active hunters that actually chase down, immobilize and consume their prey on the foot. Here we have our little, uh, one of our little jumping spiders. And here are those pedipalps that it's using like legs uh, to manipulate the prey and kind of figure out which direction it needs to turn the prey in order to uh, best align it up to those fangs. Uh, the huntsman, as we mentioned, huntswoman is probably uh, a better term for this one, being a female. Uh, these love to live inside. Um, I, um, it's not my fault. It's just a fact. They just do. They seem to like uh, being out of the elements. They seem to like the kind of constant hu low humidity of our indoor spaces. They kind of like all the little nooks and crannies where they can uh, flatten themselves and hide, uh, coming out in the evening to hunt down uh, whatever insect species have found their way into our homes. I don't have a problem with that. If there's some insect that's big enough for this thing to want to eat, I think I would rather have a, a huntsman as a roommate rather than let's say, you know, one of the imported exotic cockroaches. Another of our native uh, hunters is the fishing spider. Yes, they catch fish and it's not a big deal. A couple of years ago, there was this article in the newspaper that this spider had been discovered in Australia that, that was big enough and strong enough and mean enough to catch fish. And us Floridians were like, discovered this is just a thing you know you go to any still fresh water go along the edge you are going to find the fishing spiders they're characterized not only by where they're found uh, but these really cool bright racing stripes that you can that you can see even from a distance uh, along their sides this is the hunting posture they've got their long legs outstretched into the water uh, just barely breaking that water surface tension so that they can pick up the vibrations underneath of something swimming by. And they are fast enough and deadly enough to land uh, prey in the, in, the, in the person of fish uh, several times their size. So uh, this spider has used its vision and its sensitive hairs uh, to detect the presence of this fish. It actually lunged underwater, sank its fangs in, immobilized the prey, brought it to shore and is 
doing that wonderful process of injecting the digestive enzymes, the digestive juices, whatever they're made of, and then re-slurping them up and getting all that wonderful uh, freshwater seafood in this case. Large jumping spider. Uh, the jumping spiders make excellent pets. They can be tamed to jump from one finger to the other. They appreciate being hand fed their uh, little live food. Um, they're quite fun to watch, full of behaviors. They tend to turn around and walk around. There's an animated jumping spider on YouTube that's quite popular. They have these expressive little faces with their with their forward facing eyes and what look like little kind of, you know, aw shucks eyebrows. Anyway, the male regal jumping spider, uh, in this case, you can spot the male. He uh, makes quite a show uh, to impress the female. So he uses these iridescent chelicery uh, to kind of dazzle the female. Again, if she's not dazzled enough, he could end up as dinner. So I've said it a million times, it's not Snow White out there. May the best spider win. Another one of our active hunters, the Magnolia Green Jumping Spider. And this one is this beautiful lime green color. It can be confused with the Lynx Spider, another elongated uh, active hunter. But the Magnolia Green Jumping Spider has this really interesting crown of orange. Uh, its eyes completely encircle the head, so it has a 360 degree view of its world. Uh, the two fo forward facing eyes are the largest. Here we have um, a close up look of those two forward, fo actually four forward facing eyes, the remaining four being located uh, towards the sides and back of the head. Uh, this one will wait on a flower or on a plant uh, for something to come by and then run and catch it in these rather elongated fangs. This is a male. And our reason I know that is because the pedipalps have these big kind of maraca shaped structures and the male spiders, the pedipalps, those, those mouth parts that look like legs, uh, if they have these large swellings, uh, that indicates the male. Uh, and that is the particular tool that the male uses to present the wedding present to the female uh, if she will accept it. So that's the green magnolia. The ambush predators, uh, they're kind of a hybrid between the two. They wait like the orb weavers, but then they jump and ambush. And this is one of the flower spiders. Uh, they can actually change their color to match the flower that they are sitting in, waiting for a pollinator, unwitting pollinator, to come along. Uh, and suddenly this otherwise yellow flower turns into this eight arm monster uh, that's come out of nowhere and is injecting that poison and immobilizing this poor little pollinator. Here's the lynx spider, another one of the ambush. I mentioned this is one that could be confused with the um, magnolia green. It's larger, and although it does have that ring of eyes around the top of the head, uh, it appears much more as just a solid black area if you see this out in your garden. You won't see that reddish orange ring on top of a lynx spider. Again, those very sensitive legs, so it uses its eyes, it uses the vibrations. This one being green, hides uh, up underneath a flower usually and then when the pollinator comes along uh, again that green plant comes alive and suddenly this monster is coming from nowhere. Uh, the flower crab spiders a lot of people call the uh, the spiny orb weaver a crab spider because of the, the spines that they have. Uh, this is the true crab spiders and they're so called because of these kind of comically enlarged front two pair of legs and the fact that they kind of move from side to side the way that crabs move. Oh look, the pedipalps, they're swollen. They have these big lobes. Is that a male or a female? Do you remember? It's a boy, well done. It's a, it's a, it's a grown boy as, as a matter of fact, he's ready to get married. So that is the flower crab spider and here we have the flower crab spider 
being very well camouflaged in and amongst some citrus flowers. So our native spiders, they have found their way to make their home and even non-native species. So uh, your garden might contain plants from all over the world. Uh, you'll have the, the lynx spiders taking advantage of that. You'll have the crab spiders. So we have this beautiful variety of spiders to go and observe. Uh, no danger to yourself as long as you keep a respectable distance. Don't mess with the young. Don't mess with the egg cases of any spider ever, but especially those uh, who could cause harm like the southern black widow spider. Otherwise, spiders completely harmless, fascinating to watch, full of all kinds of behaviors, um, hours of fun, I guess I could go on. But I'll just leave you with this non-native spider uh, smiling. This is one of the uh, lynx spiders. This is a, a Hawaiian species. Uh, who's just saying thank you for joining us today. And we hope that you've enjoyed spiders as part of Florida Supernature uh, with the University of Florida IFAS Extension Services here in Pinellas County, Florida. We hope that you'll join us next week. Thanks.